Okay, so um, welcome everybody. This is a session on designing accessible Drupal themes. My name is Heather Wozniak, and I work at UCLA in the Office of Information Technology. And I kind of have two roles there. Uh, one, I am on the web team for academic technology services. So we design websites and some web applications, um, primarily for related to academic projects and research projects, but occasionally for other kinds of purposes and campus entities as well. Um, but then 50% of my time, technically, is also devoted to the Disabilities and Computing Program, where we work with students and faculty and staff who have disabilities of various kinds to introduce them to some of the adaptive software and adaptive technologies that are available to help them to use technology in their studies or carrying out their business. And we also, in addition to training the students and educating the campus community about those things, we do evaluations of websites from around campus to help them determine whether they are, their sites are as accessible as they can be and find ways to improve them if those groups are interested in doing that. Um, so what I wanted to do today was uh, talk a bit about accessibility. Um, I'm going to talk in the beginning briefly just about the topic in general, about why it matters and who is affected by these kinds of issues. Uh, just for those of you in the audience who maybe don't know that much about accessibility, haven't really thought about it before. Um, then I'm going to get into some of the uh, common flaws that we see in designs of websites, of a lot of the sites that we evaluate, and in particular things that you can do when you are creating Drupal themes to ensure that you are making your themes as accessible as they can be. Um, and then at the end, hopefully we'll have some time to uh, go and look at maybe some of the contributed themes or other sites that Drupal sites you know that you're interested in and kind of give them a quick look over based on everything that we've talked about in the earlier part of the presentation and see how accessible we find them to be and what are some of the improvements that the designer could make to make them even more accessible. So that's basically the agenda. Um, what we are not going to cover, as I said, this is going to be um, in the first part a little bit of a basic introduction to accessibility issues and then also focus on giving you practical tips that you can actually use in creating your sites and themes. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the ins and outs of Section 508 or WCAG 2.0. Some of you may not have heard of those, but those are the two kind of standards and guidelines for accessibility that currently exist. Section 508 um, is an amendment to the U.S. Federal Government's Rehabilitation Act in the 70s. Um, they came along much later and uh, added a, a, an amendment section to deal with telecommunications and technology. And that very often is the standard that sites are trying to adhere to when they want to say that they are accessible or have a certain level of compliance. So I didn't think it would be very useful to go through the checklist of what those features are. You can do that on your own. Also, the checklist is outdated in a lot of ways, and they're looking at revising it as we speak. Um, but I'm also I'm just aiming to give you more broader tips and approaches you can use to make your site accessible and, and more usable um, just in a more general sense. I'm also not really going to talk about why ARIA, which is this new specification um, with accessible, rich internet applications, uh, things that you can add to your pages to enhance the accessibility. That's kind of a whole other topic that I don't have time to get into today. Okay, so backing up a little bit and just thinking about accessibility in general, I think for a lot of us, we know that it's something that we should be doing ideally in our sites, but we don't really sometimes know that much about it or why it matters. And it's a lot of times becomes an afterthought or, okay, I'm, I'll do that later. I'm just going to get this, this design implemented. I'm going to get the site up and running, and then I'll come back and think about accessibility at another time, which unfortunately sometimes that time never happens. So it's, it's useful if you think about it in advance and you just kind of change the way you think about creating your themes and creating your sites. So it's kind of built in from the start. Um, so the studies estimate that approximately 20% of the general population has a disability of some form. So that's actually quite a lot of people, right? That'd be like one in five people have some kind of disability that may affect the way that they are able to use computers, use technology, or browse the internet. 
Um, so if you think about that one in five, that, that's a lot of people that could be potential customers for your site, readers, community members, contributors, clients, employees on a company intranet, you know, you name it. Whatever your site is designed to do, whoever your audience is, potentially 20% of your audience may be coping with a disability of some kind. So, of course, we don't really want to leave them out of things just because, in principle, it's not really nice to discriminate against people or exclude them if we don't have to. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's the law. That as there is this Section 508 standards that come from the government. If you are working on sites that are being built for a government office, um, sometimes certain public education institutions or NGOs or other projects or sites that are getting funding somehow from the federal government, it may be a requirement that your site has to be 508 compliant. Um, but that doesn't, that, that doesn't necessarily cover everybody, so a lot of people think, well, the law doesn't apply to me, I'm not going to worry about it. Well, guess what? Who knows? It could become law for everybody at any time. In fact, there is, uh, I don't know if it's legislation or in judicial system or what, I know I was reading about it recently, but there are considerations to make a more universal accessibility standard that would apply to all websites in general. So it'd be better to have that already in, your pl in, in place on your site and be ahead of the game um, instead of having this law handed down to you and suddenly you have to go back and evaluate and remediate and do a lot of work on your sites. Um, so briefly, to go over what some of the different types of disability your users might be experiencing, uh, they can be broken down into a lot of categories. These are some of the broader categories. Some of them may experience problems with seeing, so that could go from anything to complete blindness, where they can't see anything at all, to color blindness, where they're only able to distinguish certain colors in the spectrum, to just low vision, where they have trouble focusing or seeing small items or uh, reading things that don't have enough contrast. Uh, people also can have problems with their hearing, so they may not be able to experience any audio that you have on your site. Uh, they may have problems with speech, which is not usually as much of a problem on the computer because less often you're having people speak and vocally interact with your site, but on occasion that, that may be something to consider. Um, some users will have problems with mobility and motor control. They may not be able to use a mouse or a trackball or some other kind of device that involves very fine motions and ability to control their body in certain ways. And then there's also a lot of users that have issues with their cognition and their memory and their ability to process information and learning disabilities like dyslexia and attention deficit disorders. And that affects the way that they're able to uh, view and read a site and retain the information and interact with the site. So it's kind of a lot of different things that you have to keep in mind. Um, and it, it is true that these disabilities, not only is there a variety of disabilities, but they can have a lot of different kinds of causes. Um, it could be anything from genetics, where people are born with certain conditions, to an illness that causes some kind of change for them, to an accident or an injury. You know, if they're in a car accident and their hand is broken and they suddenly can't use a mouse, can't type anymore, it's actually um, pretty common. Aging, we don't really think about that as causing a disability. It's kind of a normal process that everybody goes through, right? But sometimes as you get older, you start to have more and more trouble seeing or hearing or uh, moving your hands or your body in certain ways. And then there can also be just different kinds of neurological or psychological disorders and mental illness that are going to... Um, link into some of these cognitive disabilities that affect the way people are able to perceive and interpret information. Um, so we talked about the types, we talked about the causes, and it's also important to remember that um, these conditions could be temporary. In the case of the car accident, maybe someone's hand is broken just for only six weeks, or it could be permanent where they're dealing with the condition for their whole of their life. Um, but even in the cases where someone is temporarily disabled, um, ideally, your site should account for that and be able to accommodate them for that period so they don't have to stop going about their ordinary daily business. They're still able to go online, buy the products they want to buy, visit their same blogs they like to read, you know, carry on their life as usual while they're going through this healing period. Um, and it's also true that a lot of people that are affected by these conditions, probably also 
again, this would be the case for a lot of people in that kind of temporary disabled category, they're not going to think of themselves as being disabled. They're not going to immediately try to seek out resources for disabled people and become an, a part of that community because they're still, I mean, they're, to them, they're just themselves. They're a normal human beings. So you want to try to do them a favor, make the site easy for them to use and access and not require them to go through the extra work of having to figure out how it is that, that they would do that. Um, what's my last point here? Oh, so and I, I just wanted to repeat that as the web does become more accessible, which it does seem to be doing because these standards are starting to be promoted and adopted more widely, we're probably going to see the audience of disabled users grow uh, because technology is actually, it's a really good opportunity for people with a lot of disabilities. They're able to do things and hear about things that they wouldn't normally be able to do if they didn't have access to the internet. So for a lot of them, um, we're going to see that this type of internet audience grows. And then of course also as people get older and are continuing to use the computers that they've been using since they were you know, in their younger days and they start to have the disabilities develop, then we need to be able to accommodate those audiences so that they can continue to visit the sites and do the, the tasks that they normally do. Um, so I guess just the kind of main point, bottom line of all of that that I want to stress is that your disabled audience for your site is probably larger than you think already. So it's important to try to accommodate all of those users. And that audience, whatever it is already, could very likely grow if you do make your site accessible and friendly to those users. They're more likely to come back to your site and use it or read it than they are to another site where they have a lot of trouble you know, getting to select an item and put it in their shopping cart or getting down to read the parts of the page they're interested in. If your site is accessible and easy for them to use, then they're going to come back to it. Um, and just come from the kind of selfish standpoint, you may be able to be able to win more contracts for yourself if you're able to offer accessibility compliance or accessibility enhancements as part of your design and development services, especially if you are trying to get contracts with some of these government entities that are required to be Section 508 compliant. You know, if you can promise that, then you may become more attractive than other bidders or you, know, you may be able to bid for projects that you couldn't even have bid for in the first place because you didn't have any kind of accessibility compliance. So it can be helpful for all those reasons. Um, so to go into a little bit more detail about the basic principles of web accessibility and what's behind it, I mean, the general idea is that people with disabilities in all of these different categories and forms should be able to get at all of the same information and the same functionality on a website that the normal person who doesn't have those disabilities is able to do. So we want to try to figure out ways that we can make that happen for them. Um, this is just a quote from the W3C Accessibility Initiative, and the way, this is the way that they define web accessibility. It kind of just says what I said, but I think I like in a lot more words. But if you want to see that's their official definition of it, um, there it is. Um, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. More specifically, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web, and that they can contribute to the web. Web accessibility also benefits others, including older people with changing abilities due to aging. Um, so some of the things that your users may not be able to do that you may not normally think about them not being able to do would be to see the screen at all. And it is true people may visit your site without having any ability to see it whatsoever. They may not be able to use a mouse or a keyboard. They may not hear any audio. They may not be able to read small text. They may not be able to distinguish certain color combinations. They may not be able to process fast moving images or text. And they also may not be able to complete tasks in a very limited amount of time. Um, so um, if they can't do these things, these are some of the things that they might be doing instead or in place of that. Um, they may be using a screen reader or a braille display. A screen reader is a program software that they install on their computer that, like it says, reads out loud what is on the screen that most the sighted users would normally be seeing. So it becomes audio text that they are able to listen to and they're able to get the content of the web page or their computer desktop or the Word document or whatever it is they're looking at that way, audioly, um, 
so they can listen to it. And a braille display uh, is uh, it's sort of like a keyboard, but it, it has little rubberized pins that can drop up and down and create braille letters so they're able to feel that with their fingers and read what's on the screen through the braille display instead of looking at what's on the screen. Um, your users might also be using only a keyboard to use their computers and navigate your site. They might also be using a switch or some other kind of assistive device where if they can't use a keyboard or a mouse at all, they maybe just have a simple button that they interact with in certain ways that allows them to move on the screen and select different items. They may be issuing voice commands. Um, they may zoom or enlarge their text um, or view your sites at a really small resolution on a large monitor in ways that you're maybe not anticipating them to do, but there are still a lot of users that do this. Um, I know for me, I'm in my 30s, so I see my parents and my grandparents are the ones that are, have trouble seeing. And like I go to my grandmother's house and I go to her computer screen, it's like, boom, this huge, big thing, because she likes the text really big and clear on the screen for her like that. And there's actually a lot of people that are like that, so you have to keep that in mind when you're designing your site. Um, and then lastly, your users might turn off the audio or the video or the images on their site simply because they find them distracting and they're not interested in them. They're just trying to focus on the content of what is there. So some of the things in general that you should do um, when you are developing your site is to design for device independence. Since we've mentioned they could be using all these different kinds of devices to visit your site and able to enable the functionality regardless of what kind of device they're using. Um, use semantic page structure, which I'll talk about this more in a minute when we're going to look at a, a sample site. Uh, provide media in multiple modalities. Um, so usually that means providing alternative text for non-text content. So if you do have any kinds of audio or video, you may need to provide um, transcripts or closed captioning or even just some kind of brief textual summary of the content of that media so that someone can't access it in the one modality, they can access it in the other. Um, you want to choose legible, scalable fonts and color schemes. You want to make sure that you label all of your form fields so that the input fields are associated with a text label. Um, if I'm not going to get into this really today because it's not so much with theming. Sometimes this comes in more at the module le level where the forms are being created and occasionally people forget to create um, associate labels with the field. And what happens to a user who is using a screen reader they come to this text box they, or this radio button. They're supposed to enter something or select something, but they have no way of knowing what's supposed to go in that field. So there's a really easy way to do that in your code. Um, and Drupal core usually takes care of that for most of the main form fields that are appearing. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind if you're, if you're developing your own form fields. And then lastly, um, you want to make sure that all of the files you're linking to on your site are accessible as well. So a, a common problem, a mistake a lot of people will make is they add some content, they upload PDFs or Word documents or something, and the thing is this, your website itself may be very accessible, but the PDF, depending on how it was created, may not be easy for a screen reader or someone using another kind of um, device technology to read and understand. So then you kind of defeated the purpose of doing all this work to make your site accessible if some of the content on there is not accessible and they download it and it's, it's just junk to them. So you want to make sure that you create your PDFs and other documents to be accessible. And again, that's kind of another topic that there's not time for today. Um, so now this will get a little bit more interesting, I promise, because we're going to actually start looking at an example theme and website and think about what are some of the common design flaws. And these are all going to be things that you can control at the theme level when you are creating a site. Um, and these are kind of design flaws that we see a lot when we're doing the evaluations. Now, a lot of the sites that we evaluate are not necessarily based on Drupal. If you are building with Drupal and using a, um, or starting from a contributed theme that has a pretty solid history and background behind it, chances are it may already be fairly accessible when you start. And you may not have to worry about some of these things as much. But I know there are some designers who sometimes kind of start from scratch and building their theme, and they don't re-add a lot of these accessibility features. So I just kind of want to go through them and point them out so you can make sure that you're aware of them and try, try to incorporate them. Um, the first really common design flaw that we see is a web page that has very little or no semantic structure. 
Um, so that, let me go ahead and pull up my sample site. Okay. So this is an example site. This is a theme that I created. It's pretty simple and basic. Um, you may not like it. That's not the point. I just kind of created this to help us illustrate some of the points for discussion for today. Um, so the first thing that we're talking about is the semantic page structure. That means marking up things on your page with heading as headings, heading tags, um, like the H1 through H6 tags, to indicate that this is a heading, this is the beginning of a section on my page that's about a specific topic, and also using lists, ordered lists, and unordered lists to associate, to group together pieces of content that are related. Um, so I want to, uh, I guess let me just say a little bit about why that's important. Um, the headings are really important for two reasons. One, if you've put done any work on search engine optimization at all, you probably know that the headings on your page are really important because the text that is marked up as a heading, is that's what signals to Google or the other indexes that this is an important uh, piece of content on this page. These are the keywords. This is what this page is about. So text that is enclosed in headings gets weighted to be more important and helps your pages um, get ranked more highly in the indexes, and that's how Google's able to understand what your page is about. Uh, it's important for accessibility reasons because a lot, some of the people that are using screen readers and these other assistive technologies are actually going to be browsing your pages by the headings. So there be, when they come to your page, they're presented with a list of the elements that are marked up as headings so they can understand what are the sections on this page, and then they can actually jump to the heading of the particular topic that they're interested in. Um, so I have on, uh, I'm using Firefox right now, and I've installed this free add-on that I recommend to, that can help you evaluate the accessibility of a site. It's called the Wave Toolbar, and I'll have a link for it a, a little bit later on in the presentation. But basically, it allows you to examine a site um, from a couple of different viewpoints, but I find it to be really handy. You can do an outline view and a text-only view, and the outline view will show you immediately what the semantic structure of your document is. So just by looking at this page, um, what are some of the things that you would expect to be important or marked up as headings if we were to look at the semantic structure on this page? Right, the title. Uh, the title of what? The title of the site or the title of the page? Okay, both, right? And this is also kind of a SEO thing. Um, you'll hear it's usually recommended that you should only have one level one heading per page and that that level one heading should be the title of the main content of that page. There are some people who like uh, or will debate that the title of your site should be marked up as a level one heading as well. Um, but I think I've heard pretty convincingly a lot of the experts say that, no, that's not really true because the name of your site is going to appear um, probably on every page in your site and be mentioned in other places throughout your site. And is usually, if you've done your pages correctly, is included in the document title that appears at the top of the browser win window. And people who are coming to your site uh, if they're going to be searching for the name of your company or your site, they probably already know you and they want to go to your site. So it doesn't really make sense to use up your search engine karma on the name of your site. You're better off just um, labeling that not as a heading, but uh, maybe with a strong or emphasis tag. You can style it as a heading so, so that visually it might be large text or more impressive or whatnot, but it doesn't really make sense semantically to mark it up as a level one heading because you'd rather mark up the main content on your page. Um, okay, so we have the site title, the page title. Anything else on here that you would expect to see as a heading? Block yeah, the, the block titles, because those are kind of component sections on the page that you might expect someone to want to go to. So um, usually most themes are um, set up to, to do it that way. I've kind of gone and messed with this one a little bit, so it doesn't. So, But if I click on the outline structure, uh, so we can see here exactly what is marked up as a heading, and we can see immediately that actually this is not what I expected to see. Um, we don't have the site title here at all, which maybe that's okay, because as I just mentioned, the site title doesn't necessarily have to be displayed as a heading. Uh, but uh, let's see, there's main menu. 
but there's none of the block titles, right? And that's because I've gone through um, and in making our this theme as an example, instead of uh, marking them up as titles, I just marked them up as divs with a special class applied to them that I could then you know, make look however I wanted. It looks like a heading, but your browser's not actually understanding it as a heading, and that means your screen reader technologies and other technologies are not going to understand it as a heading either. So um, it's important when you're laying out your theme and creating your templates that you do use headings in places where it makes sense to use headings. And that you also think about that heading structure of whether you do you want to make your site title marked up as a heading or not. Um, usually, okay, let me reset this. If I go, so if I drill down to a a page in the site, so here we do have an H1 heading and it's the the main content of the page, and I have one H2 heading, but you can see there's like a lot of stuff on that page that because it's not marked up as a heading, it's not appearing in the in the navigational structure for those who browse by heading. And it's not appearing for Google, right? Google doesn't know that you have sections on these different topics because you're not signaling to them that yes, I have sections on these different topics. Um, the text only view can also help you see this kind of thing um, because also you, you can scroll through a page. Actually, let me go back to the, the home page. Um, so if you don't have headings and subheadings on your page, you'll find when you go to a text-only view that you kind of have a lot of undifferentiated text. Or like, so I have here my headings that aren't really marked as headings. So there's kind of a label there for what it is. But for someone who is listening to the page being read out loud, they have to wait for all of that stuff to be read before they can get to the who's online box. And then suddenly, you know, 20 minutes later, oh, here's who's online. So it's a lot nicer if they can have those headings marked up to, to navigate. Um, okay. Let me go back to my presentation. Hopefully I covered everything there that I meant to cover. Um, okay, so then the next thing, this is kind of related, is that a lot of times you'll find people take text and put it in background images, which I did on the example site, which I know it looks kind of silly, but I just kind of did it to illustrate the point because actually, it's actually really common that you see people doing this for whatever reason. They have some, you know, nice font style that they're using, or they want to overlay it with a, you know, really neat background that they developed. And it's easy with CSS to just drop background images in all different places, and even to programmat programmatically make those background images change. So it's kind of a convenient solution for the designer. Um, but it's really bad for SEO and for accessibility purposes because, you know, as you can see, when you go to text-only mode, you know, where's my groovy site title? It's like it's non-existent because it's in a background image. There's no way to add in alt text for it. Um, for regular foreground images, they can have an alt attribute where you specify in text what the content of the image is and usually what it says if it's a text image, but with a background image, there's no way to do that. So it just kind of drops off the face of the planet, and that's that's no good, as we just said, for SEO and for accessibility reasons. So it's better to, you know, obviously, um, if you're really married to this, like, this complex image that you can't live without, to use it as a foreground image in some way so that you can apply the alt text to it. So I can have an alt text of groovy dev site. I can even mark that image up inside a heading tag if I wanted to. So it will still be understand the text groovy dev site would be interpreted as a heading. It could appear for screen reader users. It could appear for Google. But then I could still have my imagistic effect, whatever it is I was trying to do. Um, this happens a lot, too, in um, sometimes fancy plugins. Different kinds of slideshow viewers or displays are not as accessible as they could be because they don't include the alt text for the image as it's changing out or they're putting it in as a background image that changes instead of a foreground image. So it's important to try to get those as foreground images or just use text and CSS styling for those elements. Okay, let's see. What's that? Okay, um, no skip navigation. You know, skip navigation, oh, sure. Just a question. Do you know of an image slideshow plugin or something that is accessible? Um, you know what? Uh, okay, to be really honest with you, where I'm working at right now, I love Drupal. 
And I haven't been working with Drupal for the last several months because they have us working with some other CMS technology. So I'm not really up on my Drupal modules and stuff as much as I could be. So I'm sorry, I'm not able to tell you if that's the case. I mean, I do know that in, um, like on the Drupal Camp LA site, that cool thing they have on the front page with the featured speakers that changes. Um, I think that there, there were some problems there. I didn't see alt text for some of the images and you couldn't even navigate to select some of them. I think that was, is it Lightbox that they're using for that? I'm not quite sure. It's the most popular. Yeah. And I mean, I would think it's probably not too hard to go in and add those little bits of extra, to include some kind of alt text or labeling in some way as a patch for it or something. But yeah, offhand, I don't, sorry, I don't know. Okay. Well, there was another question. How about the technique of having the actual text on the page but using CSS to make it disappear for people that can see it, and showing a background image? And if you're in the screen reader, you see the text. Yeah, um, that could be doable. That's sort of related to what I'm going to talk about now, because that's one of the tricks for getting skip navigation into your site for people that really hate it and can't stand to have that skip navigation link in the top of their um, site theme. So you could maybe adapt these techniques to do that in some way. Um, okay, so the skip navigation. Um, Oh, I forgot I'm supposed to be showing you. I have, a, I have a more accessible version of my little demo theme that I'm supposed to switch back and forth, but I guess we didn't need to do that yet. Um, the, okay, so the skip navigation is important because um, for two reasons. Um, screen reader users, as we've been saying, they may not want to listen to all of the contents of your page. They may just come to it, and if the first link on your site can allow them um, depending on how your site is laid out, it might enable them to skip directly to the navigation. Or if you have a lot of navigational elements and you know cool blocks and changing content on the top, and the content is kind of buried way down the page, you might, may want to allow them to skip to the content so they don't have to wade through all of that. So it's useful for um, screen readers, but it's also really useful for keyboard only users who are just using their keyboard, they don't have a mouse, they can't point and click where they need to go, and they're pressing the tab key to get through all of the links and focusable elements on your page. So like on this site, if I want to see, um, I don't know, who's new? Heather. Oh, I, I want to um, find out about her. So I have to start pressing the tab key, and sure, I'm moving through all of the fields in some way, but it's going to take me a really long time to get to, oops, I skipped it, right, that, that link that I was trying to get to. So the this, this skip navigation is helpful for screen reader users and keyboard only users. And the best thing to do is to, all right, so let me show you an example of a site of my theme that does have it. Um, you want it to be the very, very first thing on the page because if the idea is you're providing a con convenient shortcut to the um, most desired or most needed content. It should be the very first thing that the user comes across. Um, so what I've done in this theme is, actually I haven't done it, this is based on Zen and they have this built in to Zen. Uh, there is a skip navigation link. When I press the tab key, it become, it's the very first item on the page. And when I press the tab key and that link gets focused, it suddenly appears for me. So that's pretty cool. So then it's hidden from the people who um, Presumably, don't need to use it, don't want to see it, but the people using the keyboard that start pressing buttons, immediately it becomes apparent to them that there's a skip link there and then they could take advantage of it. Um, so that's one way to put it in your theme if you want to include it but not have it visible for everybody. Um, there's a couple disadvantages to this approach. One is the fact that it is hidden, so the user may not know it's there until they do press a button. Um, it also may be a little bit disorienting, like all of a sudden this link is appearing and you know disappearing and can be a little bit strange. Um, I don't know what that's doing. Um, also, depending on how you set it up, if, if you use this approach, uh, it's kind of hard. Well, it's very easy if you just have one link that's going to either have focus or not have focus, and you can make it hide or disappear. But if you want to have a couple skip navigation links, like skip to navigation and skip to content, then those become two different elements. And so you kind of have the problem of, okay, skip to navigation is focused. I can make that appear. But now what happens to my uh, skip to content link? So then they press it again, and then that one might come into view. So you have to be a little bit careful about how you're setting it up so you don't just have too many 
um, different skip links appearing and disappearing, and it's becoming more disorienting than helpful. Um, I think really the best approach is to is to make it visible for everybody, but just you know make it very small. It can be aligned on the right side of the page, and it can be you know, usually you can get it to just kind of your eye doesn't really pick up on it. It blends into the design fairly well, but the people that are using their keyboard or assistive device are kind of on the lookout for it, and so they'll be able to see it there and know it's there. And the screen reader users um, doesn't make a difference because the the positioning and stuff is not really being um, adhered to by them anyway, so it's, it's the first thing on the page for them. Um, there are some tricks about the way you code this, which I have some slides later on that I'll show you, I guess, when I get to that. Um, but it is a, it's, you've got to do it. You don't want to just use display none or uh, visibility hidden because that actually tells even the screen readers, just don't display this element at all. It's not a part of the page. So you have to do a little bit of tricks with positioning to position it off page, but in such a way that the screen readers will still know it's there and the keyboard users can still get it to uh, appear properly. So I have the code for doing that later, which um, I'll show you. Um, let's see, skip navigation. Okay, uh, this is also really common too, not using the, the pseudo class, the focus, to go along with hovers in your CSS. And I don't know if this is because people forget about it or some designers just don't know about it, but there's actually this whole pseudo class that is designed to help you apply CSS effects to elements when they gain focus. So I think we see all kinds of sites that have cool hover effects when someone hovers over something with their mouse. So let's go back to my, um, my sad theme. It's sad because it's not as accessible as it could be. So if I go to you know, my main menu, I can see that these elements kind of light up. Um, as I browse over the links, they turn different colors. OK, cool, I can click on this stuff. Um, I think as you saw earlier, if I'm a keyboard user and I'm tabbing through stuff, I'm not getting any of that. I have this little bit of a dotted line for my system focus indicator, but that's not really too helpful. Well, it's really easy if everything that you're doing using that hover pseudo class on your A tag or and whatever elements, you can also use the the focus pseudo class, and it'll do the same thing when someone uses the keyboard to give an element focus. So here, I can do the same thing, and I'm pressing tab, and I should have used my skip link. Um, when I get to the main menu, you can see that it start it's working exactly in the same way as it was with just the mouse. So that's a really easy way to make it a lot more convenient for your keyboard users to see where they are on a page and what element they've selected at a certain time and to, to get the context of that. Um, okay, um, so then the next thing I wanted to talk about is not having enough color contrast. I, know, I think a lot of us fall in love with our designs and we just have a certain color palette and everything looks fine and beautiful, but it's important to actually check the contrast between your foreground colors and your background colors and make sure that it is going to be readable for the majority of people because what looks good to you may not be actually very user friendly, especially for people with color blindness or just kind of, um, you know, vision problems. So I think you saw that my um, the sad theme, no, that's not my sad theme. It's a little bit harder to read for even just the average user because the contrast between the text is not as strong as it could be. Um, so there's a couple different things that you can do to check the, the uh, contrast of your color combinations. There is um, at WebAIM, which I have the link to WebAIM, See if I have it in here. Uh, they're a really good resource for all kinds of stuff about accessibility, both just tools and checkers that you can use to evaluate things, and also even just like discussions of why an issue matters and what are the debates about, you know, how do you do skip links? What are the different approaches and which is the one that people have settled on as being the best practice? So um, if you're at the early in the design process and you're actually coming up with colors, you can just put in your foreground color, your background color here and it will check it for you and tell you whether it 
it passes or not. So you can see here I'm getting fails um, for both the AA and AAA level of the WCAG guidelines for normal text and kind of for the large text too. So that's kind of helpful in the early stages before you even code, put the colors into your code. You can check out the combinations and see whether they're um, as good as you want them to be. Um, then another thing you can do is um, there you can run checkers on it after the fact. There's this accessibility toolbar from Juicy Studio that I kind of like because you could uh, click on the color contrast analyzer and it just generates this chart for you that takes into consideration all of the color combinations that are available on your page. Now it's a little bit tricky because sometimes some of the things listed here you're not actually using them because it's just kind of going through and looking at every a possible CSS color combination, background, foreground combination, but it still gives you a good sense. Um, you can scroll through and see all this yellow means it's not passing. So that can indicate to you that you may need to go back and revisit some of your color combinations and enhance the contrast on them. So I think you saw on the on this site the contrast is stronger and it becomes easier to read for most people. Even for you know, average sighted users who can see well, sometimes it makes a difference. Okay, I think there's just one more of the common flaws that we see a lot of. Um, okay, so the last one I wanted to point out here, because again, this is something really easy to control with the theme level, is not having any cue that something is a link besides having it show up in a different color. So I know, I think a lot of us like to have links without the underline just because we feel like it makes our themes look a little bit more cleaner and modern and just, you know, not as much clutter. But the reality is that that can actually be harder for a lot of people to use and understand your site, um, especially if your color combinations, if there's not a lot of difference. Like here, where, I don't know where, where's my link, here it is. So this Abiko Sum Facilisi is a link, but it's kind of hard to tell that just by looking because there's no indicator besides the difference in color. I do, when I mouse over it, I can see, okay, that's a link. But it would be nice if there was some other kind of cue besides color um, that would help me to understand which things are clickable and which things are not. Um, sometimes if you do user testing on your site, um, like using heat maps and stuff that can also help you see that people keep trying to click on stuff that is not a link and that's because you probably have somehow not set up a clear indication for your users of you know what is a link and what is not. So underlining is one obvious way to do that. If you really don't like the style of an underline, it's too heavy, um, you can use borders like dotted borders or dashed borders or um, bold the text to make it stand out a lot more from the text around it. So there's other things you can do. This is actually one of the Section 508 standards, is that there needs to be an indicator besides color to indicate that um, an action is possible. It's important for colorblind users as well, because they may not be able to see the distinction between the color of the regular text and the color of the link. So having the underlining or other kind of signal is helpful to them. Now. Um, this, this applies mostly to the main text in the body, which is good news. That doesn't mean that you necessarily have to go through and make all of the links in your blocks and your menus and other places have this extra underlining or indicator. Because often it's, it's pretty clear from the context that those things are clickable. If something is listed in a menu, then your user can pretty easily understand that that's something they're going to click on. Um, if it's listed in a menu format and it's actually not clickable, again, that, that's another usability issue. You probably want to change the way that that is presented so that they don't mistakenly think that it's clickable. But it's not like you have to go through and start putting underlines on everything that you have on your page. Probably um, to focus on the main content areas is where that becomes really important. Okay. Um, so I have here a bunch of slides that I'm just going to skip through because it kind of repeats a lot of the information I was just explaining to you as we looked at those examples, but I wanted to include them in the presentation kind of for reference if anyone wants to go back to it later or you know, is watching the screencast online. So like here I have um, some code for one of the tricks. If you, um, to, if you need to have headings on your page but you don't want them to display to sighted users, like if there's some kind of 
Um, like for instance, the main menu, I don't want main menu to be there on my page uh, for the cited users, but for the screen reader users, it would be nice for them to understand that this collection of links belongs to the main menu. So there are ways you can have headers and other elements on your page that are invisible to cited users, but that just appear there in the line of content for um, screen reader users, and this is um, one of the CSS tricks you can use to do that. Um, Drupal 7 is going to have this class um, built in, so you can just apply it to any element you want to to suddenly make it disappear for sighted users. Uh, but in the meantime, if you're developing your own themes or you know, or working with Drupal 6, you can kind of just create your own by using these settings. Um, this was about the background images. Okay, skip navigation. Um, so again, I, here I just have the code for, um, this is one of the ways you can make the skip link hidden until it gains focus and then it appears. So it's basically just changing the positioning from absolute, being absolutely positioned off screen to static where it's rendered there in the, in the content where it appears, which it should be the very first item in your page. Um, that's just the focus on the hover. And that's about the links. Okay. Um, I guess we don't have very much time left. So instead of going through, these are kind of other flaws that we see a lot, but they're a little bit harder to control at the level of the theme and the design. Um, but um, I'll just read them out loud really quick. And then um, no alt text on the images, empty alt text um, can be okay. So even if, if you have a text that you don't need to explain exactly what it is, you still need to have the alt attribute um, with quotation marks with nothing in between it, because then at least the screen reader knows, okay, there's an image here, it doesn't matter to the page, I can skip over it. Um, okay, you know what, I guess I will just skip these for time. I kind of want to read them out loud for people that are watching the screencast who can't see it, or are just listening to my voice. Since we only have five minutes left, I think I'm just going to have to skip through it. Um, these are links to some of the free checkers and tools that um, I find to be most handy and useful to use because there's a lot of accessibility checkers and tools out there. It's hard to know what's useful and what's not. I find a lot of the automated report generators are really not that useful because in the end, you still have to go through it by hand and check whether its evaluation on each point is actually valid or not. And um, sometimes um, they don't keep up with the changes in technology with new standards for CSS and HTML. So you're better off just doing your own human um, check of the site. Um, so I have here the Wave toolbar link. You can get that from WebAIM, a couple color contrast checkers, and then a site that's really cool for checking how is, um, your page would appear to users with different kinds of color blindness. Because um, there's different varieties that people can perceive different colors and not others. And you can kind of put this filter over your site to see how the design is going to appear to people with those different ones. Um, so if you're trying to self-evaluate your site, again, you can use these free accessibility checking tools. Um, it's really useful to examine your site in outline and text-only modes to really understand how screen readers and search engines are perceiving your site. Um, you can try using your site with only a keyboard and see how well you're able to get around and if you're actually able to use it. Um, it's a good idea to, to zoom the text in and out because sometimes you find that your design doesn't scale as well as you would like it to. And then running the design through color simulators is also helpful. Um, so we only have a couple minutes. Um, I could do a few questions or if we want to take a look at some other example theme, if anyone has a burning desire to evaluate a certain theme or site and see um, how accessible we find it to be, we could do that. Um, I'm not really sure what would be more useful. So I guess your question can be how does such and such theme evaluate or you can ask another question if you have something else that you wanted to ask. Creating um, some custom content with CCK, the, the help actually comes in a linear flow after the form input. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to affect that because also the back end, in other words, the input for the user has to be accessible also. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Do we have to switch the variables around? I realize it's a more specific when we yeah, you know, I wish, I, like I said a little bit earlier, I've not really been working with Drupal at my work, unfortunately, so I don't really know the ins and outs as well as I should at the moment, so I'm not, I don't feel I'm prepared to answer that. But I would think that there is, would be a way to go in the module and change something in the, in the temp, either something in the template to change the order, 
or um, yeah, I think that might be the best way. Or to maybe add some kind of skip link for each thing almost. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay, maybe one more question. Um, mine is more like a remark. In Drupal 7, there's been an awesome contributor from up in Canada. I forget what his name is. I think he's partially cited, and that's his presence in the project is the sole reason that D7 really rocks in terms of accessibility. Um, it's made leaps and bounds. Yeah, it has. And um, one of my links here on the where I can learn more slide is to, there's a whole section on Drupal.org about accessibility and Drupal that has all kinds of information about this. Um, there's sections particularly targeted at theming and then just in, in more general. So that's one of my three recommended places to go to to get some more practical tips and guidance on these issues. Uh, just something um, that programming usability, uh, usability or accessibility at home even for people that are only marginally um, disabled. I have trouble reading mm -hmm. uh, on, on the screen. Uh, I end up using, especially on news sites and stuff like that, an extension uh, called Tiny Read that basically destroys all the CSS from the site and just makes the main content large so I can read it. Uh -huh. And if your website doesn't have the ability to resize or uh, redisplay your content in the way that I'm, I'm, going, to read it. I'm going to basically, you know, Make your site readable to me, whether it, that's the way you want to present your site or not. Uh -huh. So, do you, does do having the good, the good headings and semantic structure does that help yes, the way it comes out in that sort of representation? Yeah, um, if, if, if the site's not marked up well um, to begin with, it won't. It'll it'll say I can't find the content, it can't redisplay it for me, or I get like the comment section instead of the uh, the actual content section. Right. Okay, um, again, if we're out of time, so if anyone wants to ask me more questions, I'm happy to talk to you after. Um, so I guess I'll just wrap it up with that. So thank you for coming, and I hope you all make your sites more accessible.